Hi students, welcome to module two for pathophysiology. Our topic this week is disorders of the immune system, blood and circulatory system. Um, I think I say this every week, but this is one of my favorite modules uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think the immune system is just really fascinating. It's very complex, um, but there's also, because of that complexity, a lot we don't know about it, which just makes it kind of fun to learn about all these different diseases and disorders. Um, and then second, my first like real job, my first adult job um, was in a research lab that studied blood clotting. So anything that has to do with blood um, just gets my gets my blood going, <laughs> gets me excited. So um, this is going to be a fun module and I hope you are excited as well. So let's get to it. Um, okay, so before we hop into some specifics about uh, specifically the immune system, we're just going to do a little bit of review of things you should have learned previously in a &P. Um, So first, just a reminder, the purpose of the immune system is to fight uh, pathogens, to fight infections, right? But in order to do that, the immune system has to differentiate self, meaning like your own cells, from non-self, from dangerous external baddies. Um, so the parts of a cell that the immune system recognizes are called antigens. So what's happening is the immune system, uh, the cells in the immune system all the time are kind of like probing their environment and probing around um, and seeing what antigens are there. And if it's a self antigen, the immune system ignores it. But if it's a non self antigen, then the immune system should attack. So once again, the normal function of the immune system is to identify those non self antigens and then recognize those antigens as foreign and then attack and kill those things. But um, when the immune system sees something that is yourself, so your own cells, the immune system does just leaves that alone because it knows it's you. So that is a the normal function of the healthy immune system. Um, so that means if we're thinking about diseases and disorders related to a dysfunctional immune system, there's essentially two categories we can have. Um, we can have immunodeficiency. So that's when the immune system is not working as well as it should be, it's deficient. So in that case, um, this part of this balance would be dysregulated. So the immune system would have a hard time identifying non-self and would essentially treat it like self and just ignore it. The flip side of that is autoimmunity. So in autoimmune immunity, the immune system's almost working overtime. It's recognizing self antigens as non-self. So in this case, this part of the balance would be dysregulated. Um, so in an autoimmune disease, the immune system is mistakenly recognizing self antigens as harmful and then attacking and destroying them. Um, so that's just a little reminder of sort of the basic function of the immune system. Uh, the primary cell of the immune system that's doing most of this work are white blood cells. Um, white blood cells are also called leukocytes. Um, and white blood cells are involved in specific immune responses. Um, and there are certain categories of white blood cells that are involved in those immune responses, and those are called lymphocytes. And when we say specific, that means that these lymphocytes, um, like each lymphocyte will only recognize one specific type of pathogen. Um, so there'll be like some lymphocytes that are fighting the flu, and that's all they do. That's what we mean by specific. There's other types of immune cells and other types of immune cells that just um, kind of broadly fight all pathogens, and they're not necessarily specific. Um, so, but for these specific guys, these lymphocytes, um, there's three types of lymphocytes. There are T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. Um, so natural killer cells, they are a type of cell that kind of attacks and eats uh, bad, bad pathogens. Um, T cells are involved in kind of identifying pathogens and destroying them. And then B cells make antibodies. Okay, so a quick check for understanding before we move on. Um, what is another term for white blood cell? Yep, very good. I know you paused the video at these yellow slides and you thought about it on your own and you figured out the answers. Leukocytes, that's right. So leukocytes are another term for white blood cell. That is a super important thing to remember in this module. Another thing that's important to remember for this module is how white or how all blood cells differentiate, meaning how they go from a stem cell, like a blood stem cell, and turn into all the different types of cells that are pleasant, present in the blood. Um, so this occurs inside of the bone marrow. So in the bone marrow, there are a bunch of stem cells that have the capacity or the capability to become any type of blood cell. And that stem cell will start to differentiate. Um, so when that happens, that stem cell, uh, that differentiated stem cell can become different types of cells. So for example, a stem cell can differentiate into a megakaryoblast, and those are the cells that make the platelets, which are involved in blood clotting. 
a stem cell can differentiate into an erythroblast, which will become an erythrocyte, or in other words, a red blood cell. Or stem cells can differentiate into myeloblasts or lymphoblasts. And these are both going to become different types of white blood cells. So these five cells down here, uh, basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes, those are all examples of white blood cells. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so you should generally be able to recognize that these five types of cells are white blood cells. I wouldn't worry too much about what those types of cells specifically do, but you should recognize that those are examples of white blood cells. And then you also do need to know what platelets are and what erythrocytes are more commonly called red blood cells, what those are. Uh, the other thing I want you to recognize from this diagram is that all once the stem cell differentiates into sort of like the second phase, all of these cells end in blast. So like a megakaryoblast, a lymphoblast. Um, so these sort of like in-between cells, which we call immature cells because they're not their final stage yet, they're sometimes just for short called blasts. Um, and that's important to remember because in some types of blood cancer, you might see a proliferation of um, these immature cells. So you might see an increased number of blasts. And that is a sign that someone has a blood cancer. Okay, like I said, what are the names of cells that you need to know by name specifically for this module? Like I said, um, <clears throat> I would like you to be familiar at least with all of the types of the big types of white blood cells, but the ones in the yellow here are the ones that are going to be either on the midterm or in your knowledge text. Um, so you do need to know that thrombocytes, also known as platelets, those are involved in um, blood clotting. You need to know erythrocytes, also known as red blood cells. Uh, mast cells, mast cells are an important immune cell that releases histamine. Um, histamine is what causes allergies, so that's why you need to know mast cell. Uh, you should know natural killer cells. Remember, that's one of those uh, different types of lymphocytes. And then you should know T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. So those are the essentially six types of blood cells that you need to know specifically for patho. Okay, check for understanding. Where does differentiation of blood cells occur in the body? Yeah, so this is where those stem cells are turning into blasts and then the blasts are turning into that final mature cell that happens in the bone marrow. So all blood cells are maturing in the bone marrow first and then getting sent out into the blood. That is important to remember because if someone has a blood cancer, you are going to see some signs and symptoms related to issues with the bone marrow. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so then the last thing you need to know about lymphocytes is the function of specifically B lymphocytes. Um, so B lymphocytes are really important because they produce antibodies. Um, so the way, the way I remember that is B lymphocytes make antibodies, antibodies for B lymphocytes or B cells. Um, so like I said before, all of the lymphocytes are specific, meaning that each lymphocyte is going to recognize just one specific type of antigen or like one specific uh, disease agent. Um, so each bit, that means the same thing for B lymphocytes, right? Each B cell only recognizes one specific type of antigen. What happens is once that B cell runs into its antigen, uh, that tells the B cell to differentiate into the final form for a B cell, which is called a plasma cell. And then those plasma cells start to secrete or release um, these proteins called antibodies into the blood. Um, antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. You should know both of those words for patho. And then the cool thing about antibodies is these proteins will bind to specific antigens. And then once they bind to antigens, they are going to trigger those, uh, or they trigger essentially like an immune response to whatever is bound to that antigen. Uh, so some key things to remember here, like I said, uh, B cells or B lymphocytes make antibodies. Um, antibodies, another word for them are, are immunoglobulins and uh, antibodies are proteins that cir circulate in the blood. So how do antibodies work? Uh, so these proteins, like I said, they're produced by plasma cells. Um, and each antibody recognizes a specific antigen. And so what happens is when this antibody, which they kind of look like the letter Y, so this pink thing here, that's an antibody. And see how it matches like a puzzle piece with the yellow part of this or the pointy part of this pathogen. So they're complementary in shape, um, kind of similar to in biology when you learn about how um, an enzyme's active site has a specific shape that matches the substrate it binds to. Exact same concept, concept here the um, sort of like binding end of an antibody is complementary in shape to the antigen it is recognizing. Um, so once that happens, once the antibody finds its antigen and binds to it, it tells the immune 
or the immune system, like, hey, there's something bad happening over here. We need to uh, like attack and destroy this thing that I'm attached to. It's sort of like a flag that's like, oh, danger, danger, and brings in uh, the cavalry, brings in the immune system to fight and kill whatever that thing is. Um, so like I said, normally in pictures, we draw antibodies like this a lot of the time, like a letter Y. Uh, this type of an antibody that looks like a Y is a specific type of antibody called an IG, IgG antibody usually. Um, it turns out there's actually five different types of antibodies. We will review the five types and you do need to know all five of them. Okay, check for understanding. What is the function of an antibody? Yeah, so antibodies, they bind to those antigens and then they bring the immune system in. So by doing that, antibodies can like neutralize a pathogen or help destroy a pathogen. So antibodies are in a really important part of the immune system, specifically the immune system that is specific. So this is uh, the part of the immune system, for example, like if you get chickenpox once, you don't get it again. It's because of this spe specificity um, of the immune system. So let's talk about those five different types of antibodies. Remember, another word for antibody are immunoglobulins, or Igs. Um, that is helpful to remember when we talk about the names of these antibodies. So the first one is IgM, immunoglobulin M. Um, so I just say antibody more of the time because it's a shorter word and it is easier to say. <laughs> um, so IgM antibodies, they are found in the bloodstream and they're involved in neutralizing uh, pathogens. So they bind to those pathogens, um, they bind to the antigens and help clear them out of the body. Um, IgM antibodies are some of the like earliest antibodies to come online during an immune response. Uh, they really help to initiate the inflammatory response and help to, um, in like the initial stages of finding, fighting an infection. Um, so when you are exposed to uh, a pathogen, um, or an antigen, depending on, we'll say pathogen. Uh, so when you're, I should, sorry, I should specify why I backtrack there. So pathogens are things that make you sick. So like bacteria, viruses, things like that. The part of a pathogen that an antibody binds to is called an antigen. So that's why I've been kind of using those two things interchangeably, because if we're talking about the normal function of the immune system, where it normally should only be binding to pathogens and fighting them, then you can kind of use the word antigen and pathogen interchangeably. However, once we learn about diseases and disorders, if you're talking about an autoimmune disease where the immune system is accidentally binding to things it shouldn't, then instead of saying pathogen, I should be more specific and say antigen. So my apologies. Okay, so anyway, um, IgM, like I said, they uh, initiate the immune response. That means they're the first to come online in response to an antigen. So usually you see a spike in IgM um, and it lasts for about five to seven days. Or sorry, you see a spike at around five to seven days and they last for about five to 10 days. Um, this is a picture of an IgM antibody. So here's that Y shape. And see how it's actually like five Ys all in a, a ring. Um, so they're actually really huge IgM antibodies. And because of that, they're also called macroglobulin because of their really large size. Um, because they are so large, IgM antibodies cannot cross the placenta during pregnancy. Um, so part of when we're learning about the different types of antibodies, some of the things you should know are like, where is that antibody normally found, like in the bloodstream or in other parts of the body? And then also, um, is that antibody able to cross the placenta and actually like provide immunity to the baby or not? Um, and so for IgM, the answer is no. So IgMs do not cross the placenta. Okay, so is the first type. Uh, the second type of antibody are called IgG antibodies. This is a nice little picture of antibody, or of IgG. So it's the one that looks classically like a Y. Um, so IgG antibodies are sort of like the long-term antibody. They are the ones that um, are found in your bloodstream and they're just there all the time um, to look for any pathogen that you have previously been exposed to and then fight it before it makes you sick. So they are really important for preventing a second infection to a pathogen that you've already been exposed to. Um, because of that, they develop after IgM. So IgM comes on first and then IgG comes along later. Um, but there are way more IgG antibodies in your bloodstream than any other type of antibody. Um, and they last a really long time. Um, see how much smaller the IgG antibody is than the IgM? Because IgG is a lot smaller, it is able to cross the placenta during pregnancy. Um, and because of that, IgG antibodies are actually really important in the immune response of a newborn. 
So a newborn infant uh, takes a little while for their immune system to like fully develop and come online. Um, so IgG antibodies from the mother actually provide immunity to the infant during the first few months of life. And they're a really important part um, of keeping infants healthy in those first few months of life. Um, IgG antibodies are also really important for patho because they are involved in specific autoimmune diseases, um, specifically two types of autoimmune diseases that we'll learn about, uh, type 2 and type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Okay, the third type of antibody are IgA antibodies. Um, so IgA antibodies are secretory, meaning that uh, they are not found in your bloodstream and set, they are released in like secretory fluids. So for example, in mucus, saliva, tears, um, things like that. So IgA um, is highly concentrated in mucous membranes and in your secretions. Um, IgA is also found in breast milk. So it's also important for providing um, immune protection to a newborn. Um, so if you think about where IgA is located in your tears, your saliva, uh, like your respiratory tract, your GI tract, um, those are all the main places where you are exposed to pathogens, right? You're exposed to like flu virus droplets when you're breathing in or you eat something funky and then you're exposed to that E. coli in your stomach. Um, so uh, the immune response in your like, respiratory system, so in your nose and the mucous membranes in your nose and in your mouth, um, and then also in your stomach and your GI system, those are really important for fighting, for like preventing infection in the first place. So it's like they're fighting those pathogens before they even get a chance to really get established and make you sick. Um, so IgA is really important for that. Uh, so once again, IgA found in mucous membranes and secretions, so like your saliva, your GI system, things like that. Um, so because it's so helpful in preventing those infections, kind of stopping them before they even start, um, there's a lot of it. So IgA is actually the most prevalent immunobot immunobody <laughs> antibody in your body. Um, I said before, IgG is the most prevalent in your blood, but IgA is the most prevalent in your whole body. So IgA actually wins over IgG in terms of prevalence. Okay, that takes us to the fourth type of antibody, which are IgE antibodies. Um, IgE antibodies are really only found in two places. Uh, they are found in the pulmonary and the GI tract, so in like your lungs and in your stomach. Um, IgE antibodies, we don't know as much about sort of their normal function. We believe that they have something to do with defending against parasites and toxins, um, but the reason that IgE antibodies are important for us in patho is because IgE antibodies cause allergic reactions. Um, so when IgE binds to whatever you're allergic to, um, those IgE antibodies cause activation of mast cells, which are a specific type of cell in the immune system. And then those mast cells release histamine and that causes an allergy. Um, so IgE is prevalent in all the places where uh, if you have allergies, you experience allergy symptoms. So like your skin, think of like hives, uh, mucous membranes, so like your nose, um, and then respiratory tracts, so difficulty breathing. Um, usually, like I said, um, IgE is really only in those places, like in your pulmonary and GI tract, it's usually in very low concentrations in the blood. And that takes us to the last type of antibody, um, which are IgD antibodies. Um, so IgD antibodies are actually found on the surface of B cells. They are very rare. They only make up 1% of all of the antibodies in your body. Um, they're very important for helping B cells become activated and help them start making antibodies, but really, we really don't understand a lot about IgD antibodies and what they normally do. Um, however, we do know that they are involved in autoimmune disorders such as hypersensitivity reactions. Um, so another example for both IgE and IgD, we don't know as much about their normal function, but we do know that they are involved in specific diseases and disorders. Okay, so those are the five types of antibodies or immunoglobulins. Let's do a quick check for understanding here. So what type of antibody can cross the placenta during pregnancy to provide passive immunity to the infant? Yes, this is gonna be one of those small ones. 
Um, and it's crossing the placenta, which means it must be carried in the blood. So it's a small antibody that is carried in the blood that is IgG. Okay, how about what type of antibody activates mast cells during allergic reactions? Yeah, so that is IgE. If you hear IgE, think allergy. And then what type of antibody is found in secretions, mucous membranes, and the respiratory tract? So this is going to be the most prevalent antibody in your body because it is preventing those infections before they even happen. Um, so those are IgA antibodies. Okay. And those three I kind of went over, the IgG, those three examples, IgG, IgE, and IgA, those are the ones that are going to pop up. You'll see um, on questions on the midterm and then also in your knowledge check. So those are um, three really important functions of those three antibodies to know. Okay, and with that, that was our nice little review of some A&P stuff. So let's go ahead and get started with our first chapter for module two, which is chapter 11, disorders of the immune system. Um, so like I said before, the normal function of the immune system is to recognize those uh, non-self antigens and then attack and destroy them. But in some places, or in some cases, the immune system becomes like overactive and recognizes self antigens as harmful and then kind of overreacts and destroys those self antigens and causes harm. Um, so that type of uh, a process is called a hypersensitivity. Um, so hyper means more. So the immune system is just more sensitive than it should be. So it's recognizing things it shouldn't. Um, this is sometimes also called an autoimmune disorder, auto meaning self. Um, so like a a reaction where the immune system is recognizing itself and it shouldn't be. Um, so there are four types of hypersensitivity reactions and you do need to know um, all four. So let's go through them one by one. Uh, so the first one are type one hypersensitivities. Um, these are called immediate hypersensitivities because the reaction happens right away. Um, so there's really only one example of type one hypersensitivities and those are allergies. We've already learned something about allergies. What's the antibody that causes allergy? That's right, IgE, allergy IgE. Um, so once again, this is an immediate response and it is essentially an overreaction to IgE antibodies binding to something that is harmless. Um, so these harmless antigens that are uh, recognized by IgE antibodies, we call these allergens. So for example, you, you breathe in some pollen, and there are IgE antibodies in the mucosa in your nose that bind to that pollen and then elicit an immune response. So what happens is when that IgE binds to that pollen, um, it is going to cause activation of mast cells, which are a type of cell in the immune system. Um, and then those mast cells release a whole bunch of chemicals, especially histamine. So that's why if you have allergies, the medicine you take to treat your allergies are antihistamines because they are treating this chemical that is released from mast cells that are activated by IgE antibodies. So signs and symptoms of type one hypersensitivities. These are signs and symptoms of allergies. So if you have allergies, you already know what this is, um, but essentially the signs and symptoms are related to vasodilation because you're activating the immune response, which is gonna activate uh, inflammation, right? So you're gonna have vasodilation um, and like increased vascular permeability. So because of the vasodilation and increased vascular permeability, you see things like hives, um, a runny nose, and then shock. Shock is essentially systemic low blood pressure. Um, and then you also have bronchoconstriction, meaning um, closing of the airways. So that can cause bronchospasm and difficulty breathing. Once again, if you have allergies, just think classic allergy symptoms. Those are symptoms of type one hypersensitivities. Oh, no animations on this slide, sorry. Um, so some examples, like I said, allergies, um, most common is allergic rhinitis, also called hay fever. This is essentially an allergy to pollen, um, causes you know runny nose, bronchoconstriction, things like that. Um, a life-threatening example of a type one hypersensitivity is anaphylaxis. Uh, so this is essentially a systemic allergic response. So you might have like hives and bronchoconstriction similar to a more uh, localized uh, allergic response, but then you also will have um, like swelling if you uh, you can have uh, like closing of the airways, things like that. 
Um, because of that, death can happen within minutes in someone who has anaphylaxis, just because essentially it can stop breathing. Um, this is considered a medical emergency, and this is why um, some people who have really severe allergies might ca carry an EpiPen. Um, an EpiPen essentially blocks the effects of histamine, so it's sort of like an antidote to that over-response of histamine. Um, and it works really fast, and it's much more drastic than an antihistamine. So um, EpiPens would be used to treat anaphylaxis until someone can get the medical help they need to, to further treat it. So, okay, check for understanding. What type of antibody is responsible for type 1 hypersensitivities? Type 1 hypersensitivities are allergies, allergy, IgE. Good. So, move. Here we go. Um, in type 1 hypersensitivities, IgE antibodies stimulate blank cells to release blank. Yep, so in Ig or sorry, in type 1 hypersensitivities, those are going to be mast cells that released histamine. That's why when you have allergies, you take antihistamines to stop the effects. So that's type 1. Um, moving on to the next type of autoimmune disorder, these are type 2 hypersensitivities, which are also called cytotoxic. Um, cyto means cell and then toxic. So these are um, hypersensitivities where the problem is called by essentially a cell getting killed. Um, so what happens in type two hypersensitivities is you have antibody dependent cytotoxicity. So what happens is an antibody will come along and bind to a specific cell and then destroy that cell. Um, so a defining feature of type two hypersensitivities is they are tissue specific, meaning those antibodies aren't just like killing all of the cells all over the place. They are killing cells in like specific types of cells. So for example, they're killing like blood cells or something like that, and just those cells. Um, so the way that this happens is you have antibodies that are recognizing self antigens. So those are called auto antibodies, meaning self antibodies. Once again, that is an abnormal thing. Those antibodies bind to those cells. And then the immune system doesn't know any better. It just sees that an antibody is bound to something. So it's like, okay, I guess we're destroying this thing. And so it attacks and destroys that cell and that tissue. Um, so signs and symptoms of type 2 hypersensitivities depend on what cells are being killed. Um, so essentially, you just have to figure out, oh, if whatever this cell is, whatever this organ is, if it stops working, then what would we expect to see for signs and symptoms? Um, so some examples of type 2 hypersensitivities, um, a lot of them have to do, or a lot of them involve blood. Um, so a lot of times type 2 hypersensitivities, the antibodies are binding to cells in the blood. So all of these examples are actually related to the blood in some way. Um, so for example, acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, this is essentially if you get a blood transfusion and then have an immune response to that blood transfusion, that is an example of a type two hypersensitivity. Um, this is why you have to uh, check blood types before you give someone blood. Because if you don't do that, then they would have a transfusion reaction, which is the type of type two hypersensitivity their antibodies would bind to those blood cells and attack and destroy them. And that's really bad because usually if you're giving someone a blood transfusion, it's because they need that blood. So if the immune system then attacks and kills those blood cells, it's going to be really bad. Um, so some signs and symptoms of specifically these blood transfusion reactions are things that are related to sort of that um, immune response to so things like fever and chills. And then uh, things that are related to essentially needing uh, blood cells that are getting killed. So dipsia, which is trouble breathing, that's due to decreased oxygen. Um, and then also chest pain, that can be due to that decreased oxygenation as well. Um, some other examples, we're going to talk more about some of these, or about the second one, erythroblastosis fatalis in a second. So I'll leave that for when we get to that one. Um, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, or ITP. Um, so this is when you have uh, antibodies that bind to platelets and then destroy those platelets. Platelets are involved in blood clotting. Um, so if you destroy platelets, then you have increased risk of bleeding because the blood isn't clotting enough. Um, so classic uh, sign of ITP are petechia, which are these little pin, pin prick bruises, um, or they, they're technically not bruises because they're not caused by trauma, but they look like little bruises. So they're just little tiny pin pricks of bleeding in the skin, which is what a bruise is, so, okay. So that is type two hypersensitivities. 
let's move on to type three. Uh, so type three hypersensitivity is an immune complex hypersensitivity. Um, it feels a little similar to type two, but, but it's different. So in type two, you have an antibody that's binding to a specific cell, um, which is like, you know, part of a tissue. So a very specific uh, reaction. So like that antibody is binding to red blood cells and only to red blood cells. And the problem is because when that antibody binds to that red blood, blood cell destroys it. That's type two. Type three hypersensitivities still have to do with antibodies, but now those antibodies are binding to something else that is not a cell or not tissue. So it's binding to like some other junk and you're, you're essentially making these immune complexes. So these active um, little complexes that are going to turn on the immune system and be like, oh, we have something going on. Um, and then the immune system is going to freak out and start to attack things that it shouldn't be attacking. Um, so the signs and symptoms of type 3 hypersensitivities have to do on where these immune complexes end up settling kind of within the body. So usually um, you're going to have, for example, like these immune complexes settling like in the kidneys because the kidneys are filtering the blood. So then you can have um, signs and symptoms related to kidney damage, for example. Um, so, so you can also have, sorry, you can also have systemic signs and symptoms because you have these immune complexes just floating all around through the body. So some examples of type three hypersensitivities, uh, two classic ones that you absolutely need to know. The first is systemic lupus erythematosus or just lupus for short or SLE. Um, so once again, you have the deposition of these immune complexes. So antibodies binding to some antigen. Um, in lupus, the antigen is actually DNA. Um, so if a cell, usually antibodies can't get to DNA because the DNA is inside of a cell. But if cells get damaged and, uh, you know, maybe die by necrosis, so all of their contents spill out, now those um, antibodies can bind to that DNA that has been exposed. And that's going to cause, or that's going to form an immune complex, which then can build up and cause the signs and symptoms that are associated with lupus. Um, because of that, one of the things that can cause a flare up of lupus is sun exposure. That's because sun exposure is causing damage to cells in the skin. And that damage can actually release some of that DNA, which then the antibodies bind to and causes uh, an increased number of those immune com complexes. And that causes a lupus flare up. Um, in lupus, you kind of have like signs and symptoms all over the place, but often the kidneys are frequently affected. Once again, because the kidneys are filtering the blood, so they're filtering those immune system and or those immune complexes, and the kidneys are just constantly being exposed to those immune complexes, and then that damages the kidneys. Classic signs of lupus, uh, you should actually know the, the first one, which is a butterfly rash, so a red rash on the cheeks and the bridge of the nose. Um, and then some laboratory uh, results are positive anti-nuclear antibodies, meaning someone has antibodies against the nucleus. Once again, antibodies shouldn't normally feed the nucleus of a cell, so that is not something that a person without an autoimmune disorder would necessarily have. Um, and then also anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, so antibodies that bind to DNA. Um, it's worth noting that lupus is, there's not like one test for lupus, like if you have ANA antibodies, it doesn't mean that you have lupus. Um, there's a certain number of uh, like criteria that you have to have. So I think it's like seven out of a list of 11 or something like that. And you have to have so, so many of those different criteria in order to be diagnosed with lupus. So um, it can often take a long time for someone to be diagnosed because um, it is just, you have to check off a lot of boxes before you can officially reach the diagnosis stage. Um, another example of a type three hypersensitivity is rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so in rheumatoid arthritis, um, immune complexes are depositing in the joints and then causing inflammation within the joints. Um, so this is a type of arthritis that is not uh, caused by age. So um, with aging, you just have more pain in your joints. That's osteoarthritis. That's different. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is caused uh, by type 3 hypersensitivity. So it's, it's different. Um, one of the classic signs of rheumatoid arthritis is you have um, symmetrical joint pain, meaning both sides are equally painful. 
Whereas with osteoarthritis, like old age arthritis, usually one side, the side that gets used more is gonna be more painful than the other. Okay, and that takes us to the last type of hypersensitivity, which are type four hypersensitivities, also called delayed hypersensitivities. Um, so this is mediated by T cells, which remember are one of those other types of lymphocytes. So the specific part of the immune system. Um, and these T cells are recognizing something that is not normally harmful, but then it takes a little while for the, the immune response to kick in, which is why it's called a delayed hypersensitivity. Um, so normally you see a response to the antigen around one to three days after exposure to that antigen. Um, so classic examples here would be uh, like poison ivy. Um, if you've ever gotten poison ivy before, it's not like you touch poison ivy and you get a rash right away. It usually takes a little while to develop. Um, contact dermatitis. So if someone has like a latex allergy, that is often contact dermatitis, um, which is a type of type 4 hypersensitivity. Um, or a TB test. If you, I'm sure many of you, if you work in a hospital, have probably gotten TB tests before. Um, and they look for this reaction that develops this a few days later. And that's because the reaction itself is a type of type four hypersensitivity. So it's a delayed response. So that's why you have to come back a few days later. Okay. So on this slide, you have a nice summary of the four different types of hypersensitivities, what they're also known as and their mechanism, and then a couple of examples. So uh, this would be a good thing to like make a flashcard of and just quiz yourself on the four different types of hypersensitivities. Okay. Let's do a check for understanding. Um, so go ahead and pause the video and match the mechanism to the type of hypersensitivity. Okay, so antibody-mediated destruction of specific cells or tissues. So we're killing specific cells. That is cytotoxic uh, hypersensitivity or type 2. T-cell-mediated, that's the delayed hypersensitivity, so that'd be type 4. Immune complexes depositing in tissues, that is type 3. And then IgE allergies, uh, that is type 1. Another one, match the disease or disorder to the type of hypersensitivity. So go ahead and pause it. Okay, let's see how we did. So lupus, lupus is the classic example of a type three hypersensitivity. Contact dermatitis, that's a delayed response. So that would be an example of a type four hypersensitivity. Allergies, IgE, that's a type one. And then a blood transfusion reaction. So we're killing specifically those blood cells that is a cytotoxic hypersensitivity, so that's a type two hypersensitivity. Okay, so those are all the examples of hypersensitivities being the immune system is doing too much. It is recognizing things it shouldn't be recognizing as harmful and treating them as harmful. Um, the flip side is immunodeficiency. So in immunodeficiencies, the immune system is, is weakened. It is not responding to things that are harmful, and it's just kind of letting those harmful things run rapid. So because of that, um, people who are immunodeficient are uh, more susceptible to infections, especially to opportunistic infections. Um, so an opportunistic infection is one caused by a pathogen that we're often routinely exposed to, but your immune system just keeps it under control and it doesn't make us sick. So these are the types of infections that only people are usually only people with uh, weakened immune systems will actually get these types of infections. Um, so some of, or some examples of oppor opportunistic infections are uh, different types of fungal infections, such as thrush, uh, which is a fungal infection in the throat, um, toxoplasmosis, and tuberculosis. Um, so in terms of the immunodeficiencies that you need to know, there are two types of inherited immunodeficiencies. The first is called selective IgA deficiency, um, or S-I-G-A-D. Um, it is exactly what it sounds like. This is someone who selectively does not make IgA antibodies. This is by far the most common immunodeficiency. It can be genetic or it can also be caused by um, like toxins or environmental factors. Um, uh, for example, like some types of antibiotics can cause um, selective IgA deficiency, things like that. But oftentimes we tend to think of it as a genetic condition. Um, so someone who has selective IgA deficiency uh, is missing IgA antibodies. 
And remember, IgA antibodies are the most prevalent in your body. They are the first line of defense. They are in those places that are most exposed to pathogens. So they're in your mucous membranes, they're in your stomach, um, they're in your respiratory system, things like that. So because of that, in someone who has less IgA antibodies, um, one of the classic uh, complications you'll see is they will have an increased risk of respiratory infections. And that's because IgA is located in the respiratory mucosa. Without that IgA, you just have an increased risk of those respiratory infections. So um, usually, for example, in genetic selective IgA deficiency, the usual presentation would be um, a child who is, has frequent respiratory infections. Maybe by age six, they've had like bronchitis multiple, multiple, multiple times. Um, that would be a concern that maybe the child would have selective IgA deficiency. Um, the second sort of genetic immunodeficiency is severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID. Um, so this is severe, right? So this is a severe immunodeficiency as opposed to selective IgA. So this is, we're just missing IgA. IgA is still important, right? But we still have all the other antibodies and all the other parts of the immune system. In SCID, it's severe and it's combined. So you're missing a lot of the immune system. Um, it's very rare. It is very severe. So what happens in SCID is essentially your lymphocytes are malfunctional. So T cells and B cells um, are not working. And that essentially means that that whole selective part of your immune system, the adaptive immune system that can detect specific pathogens and fight them essentially doesn't work. So that means that these people like vaccines wouldn't work for them at all. They could get chicken pox over and over and over again because that part of the immune system is malfunctioning. Um, so usually this presents, um, like I said, with recurrent infections for most people with a healthy immune system, recurrent infections don't happen because the adaptive part of your immune system prevents that pathogen from getting you sick again, but not in a patient with SCID. Uh, so presentation is recurrent infections, usually even in infancy. Um, without treatment, the life expectancy for SCID is usually around two years of age. Um, this would usually be treated with something like a, a bone marrow transplant. Okay, so those are two examples, or sorry, these two are two examples of like genetic immunodeficiencies, but by far the most well-known immunodeficiency is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, in other words, AIDS. Um, so AIDS is caused by a specific virus called HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Um, and HIV, uh, the virus itself, so actually attacks um, T cells. So in general, all viruses tend to infect one specific type of cell in your body. Just turns out that HIV specifically infects T cells, which T cells are one of those lymphocytes. They're part of that adaptive part of the immune system. Um, so HIV is going to infect the cell and then essentially mess up the T cells. It can just make it so the T cells are dysfunctional. It can actually kill the T cells and decrease their numbers. And if that happens, then you're missing part of the immune system and that's gonna cause an immunodeficiency. Um, so often the presentation for someone who has an HIV infection, um, it literally just the initial infection with HIV is going to look a lot like a lot of other viral infections such as mononucleosis, which is caused most frequently by Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so just at first you might not have a concern that it is HIV infection, um, but then the, the thing that would increase concern of HIV would be those opportunistic infections. So someone who uh, for example, like gets a thrush infection or something that most people are able to fight off. Um, and, that, and that in combination with a low CD4 count. So CD4 is a type of T cell. So essentially low T cells, that would be a concern that someone might have an HIV infection. Uh, the good news is that in the past 40 years or so, 40 years um, or so, there have been a lot of um, new medications that specifically fight HIV. Um, so the way that the virus works, the HIV virus works, is it needs um, this very specific type of protein in order to make more viruses. Um, so there's a whole class of medicines that fight those proteins and destroy them, and that is going to prevent the virus from spreading. Um, and those are called retroviral or antiretrovirals. So um, these medicines are pretty effective, um, and they really can help someone prevent uh, the HIV infection from becoming full-on AIDS, which is like a really more severe uh, characterization of 
immunodeficiency. So someone who has HIV doesn't necessarily have AIDS. HIV progresses to AIDS if enough T cells have been killed so that you actually have immunodeficiency. So treatment with those antiviral drugs then keeps the HIV infection kind of uh, tamped down. So then uh, hopefully the infection never progresses to AIDS. Okay, check for understanding. The nurse sees on the patient's chart the diagnosis of immunoglobulin A deficiency. What was the most likely initial presentation for this patient? Yeah, so remember IgA is found in all of those first line of defense places. So the nose, the GI system, and the respiratory system. So most likely initial presentation, if you don't have those antibodies in your respiratory system, would be recurrent respiratory infections, um, usually uh, presenting in childhood. Multiple severe infections, that would be indicative of SCID, that's severe combined immunodeficiency, and then a mononucleosis-like illness, that could be indicative of an initial HIV infection, or it could also be mono. Okay, so that's chapter 11, um, immune system. I do think the immune system is pretty tricky, so if you're like, oh my god, that was hard, totally. The immune system is hard. You are not alone. Um, I, I think that's the hardest chapter for this module, so I think it gets a little less complex from now on. Okay, so let's move on to chapter 12, which is disorders of white blood cells. Specifically, we're going to focus on white blood cell cancers. Um, obviously, this is related to the immune system chapter because we're still talking about those white blood cells. Um, but in this case, we're just going to focus on cancers um, of white blood cells. Um, for that, we need to remember, like I said before, that blood cells mature in the bone marrow. So in the bone marrow, you have a precursor cell, a blood precursor cell that has the ability to turn into all the different types of blood cells. Um, essentially, there's two families of blood cells, myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. Uh, so the lymphoid stem cells can become lymphocytes and the myeloid stem cells can become everything else. Um, so in blood cancers, what happens is somewhere along this tree, one specific type of cell is going to start proliferating too much. So for example, uh, let's say like a lymphoblast. These lymphoblasts just start proliferating way more than they should. Um, so in that case, that cancer would be characterized by that proliferation of lymphoblasts. Um, and the problem with that is because all of these cells are all being produced in the bone marrow, um, the bones don't are rigid, right? There's only so much space in that, in that bone marrow. So if these cancer cells start proliferating, they're essentially going to take up all the space in the bone marrow and crowd out all of the healthy cells. So if that happened, um, you would have proliferation of these immature lymphoblasts. Because they're immature, you're not going to have normal lymphocytes, so you might have like immune cell dysfunction. Um, but then also because you have proliferation of these cancer cells, you're not going to be able to make all these other cells because they're being crowded out by the cancer cells. So in that patient, you might see a reduction in red blood cells, so anemia. You might see bleeding due to lack of platelets. Uh, you might see other immune system problems due to lack of other white blood cells, et cetera. So that is a key thing to remember to understand the signs and symptoms that have to do with white blood cancers. Um, it's because that cancer cell is going to crowd out the other cells in the bone marrow, and that actually causes a decrease in those other cells. And it's because all of those cells are made in the same place and the, in the bone, and there's only so much space there. Okay, so keep that in mind as we start to talk about all these different types of blood cancers. Okay, so a little vocab here. Uh, these are things that we mostly learned in our review of prefixes and suffixes. So first one, um, the suffix penia means a decrease in the number of cells. Um, and then the prefix that would be added to that tells you the type of cell that is decreasing. So for example, leukopenia is a decrease in leuco, leukocytes. So there was a decrease in white blood cells. Neutropenia um, is a decrease in neutrophils. Neutrophils are a type of white blood cell. Thrombocytopenia, thrombocytes, um, is a decrease in platelets, which is another name for thrombocytes. So in general, any sort of penia, like neutropenia, leukopenia, is going to cause immunosuppression because you have a decrease in those white blood cells that fight infection. Um, and then you also are going to have a decrease in platelets, which is going to cause uh, a decrease in blood clotting. In other words, an increased risk of bleeding. If you don't have enough uh, 
platelets, then you're more likely to just e bruise easily and, and have bleeding problems. The opposite of penia would be philia or cytosis. Uh, philia means love and cytosis means increased in cell number. So functionally for our cases, they're gonna mean the same thing. So leukocytosis is an increase in leukocytes. Neutrophilia, an increase in neutrophils. Why well, don't I just call it neutrocytosis? I don't know. Um, thrombocytosis, increase in thrombocytes. So uh, these things are going to um, cause the opposite. So if you have more thrombocytes, that's going to increase the risk of blood clotting. Um, and then in general, if you have increases in number of cells, you're still gonna increase your risk of infection. And that's because those cells are made in the bone marrow. And if you have an increase in one type of cell, it's usually associated with a decrease in another type of cell. So in general, seeing like a big increase in one type of cell is usually uh, not a great sign. Um, that being said, you can have increased number of white blood cells like while you're actively fighting an infection. Um, so that it can also be indicative of that. Okay, check for understanding. A nurse is told that her patient has severe leukopenia. What does this mean? Okay, so leuco, which are leukocytes, which are white blood cells, and then penia means decrease. This is an abnormal decrease in the number of leukocytes. Um, in other words, a decrease in white blood cells. Okay, so in this patient with leukopenia, this patient with a decrease in white blood cells, what can the nurse expect? Yeah, so once again, a decrease in white blood cells. White blood cells are important for the immune system, right? They fight infection. So if you have a decrease in white blood cells, that means the immune system's not gonna work as well. So you'd have an increased risk of infection. Okay. Um, so with that, let's get into some specifics of different types of blood cancers. Um, so these are hematological neoplasms. Uh, hematology or heme means blood and the neoplasm cancer. So these are blood cancers. Um, there are essentially two types of blood cancers based on where those cancer cells are found. Uh, the first are leukemias. Uh, so remember when we learned our prefixes and suffixes, emia means um, in the blood. So this is going to be proliferation of whatever white blood cell, the cancerous blood cell. Um, and those blood cells themselves are going to be found in the blood or the bone marrow. So the cancer is in the blood or in the bone marrow. And then we also have lymphomas. Uh, so lymphomas is also proliferation of white blood cells, but specifically in the lymph nodes. So instead of being in the blood, the cancer cells, the um, cancer actually forms like a solid tumor, which you would feel in the lymph nodes. Um, so they both are different types of blood cancers, but the cancer itself is in different places, essentially. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about leukemias, which once again, emia means in the blood. So this is the type of cancer where the cancer itself is in the blood or in the bone marrow, as opposed to in the lymph nodes. Um, so usually leukemia is the cell that is growing out of control, the cell that has become cancerous is like a stem cell um, or one of those intermediate uh, blast types of cells of a specific line. So it's not like all blood cells would be like one specific type of blood cell. Once again, those in between precursor cells are called blasts. Um, all types of leukemias just all together are the third most common type of cancer in children. Um, their leukemias are also common in adults, but just in children specifically, leukemias are especially common. Um, and then signs and symptoms of leukemias are related to that bone marrow suppression, meaning once again, the cancer cells are crowding out the other healthy cells in the bone marrow and essentially causing those healthy cells to decrease. So you're going to see, um, well, bone pain for one, because you have cancer in your bone marrow, it's painful. Um, anemia, which is caused by a reduction in red blood cells, increased risk of infection caused by reduction in white blood cells, um, fever, it's released, related to infections, um, easy bruising because of a decrease in the number of platelets, uh, lymph, ad lymph adenopathy, which is enlarged lymph nodes, and then splingomegaly, which is an enlarged spleen. Um, some examples of leukemias that you need to know. Uh, the first is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, and the second is chronic lymphoblastic leukemia, or CLL. So let's talk about both of those in a little bit more detail. So acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, 
Um, so it's acute. So that's sudden onset, rapid progression. So this is someone who develops that cancer pretty quickly. Um, so what happens in ALL, this type of cell that is proliferating and causing the cancer are um, lymphoblasts. So either immature T cells or B cells. So essentially it's all types of lymphoblasts. That's how I remember that ALL is all lymphocytes, like all T cells or B cells, that whole lineage. Um, so it is acute onset, meaning it doesn't take years and years and years to develop. Um, so that helps me remember that ALL is actually more common in, in children. Um, but the good news is in children who are diagnosed with ALL, the survival rate is actually very, very good. The survival rate is about 90%, um, but it's much worse in adults. It's somewhere around 20 to 40% in adults. Uh, so why is it so common in children? Um, so once again, it's acute onset, so it develops fairly rapidly. Um, usually the etiology is due to some sort of chromosomal or genetic alteration. Um, that's true for a lot of childhood cancers, just because um, the more you are exposed to like mutagens and things that cause mutations, the more likely you are to develop cancer. Children haven't lived as long, so they haven't been exposed to as many of those harmful factors. Um, so a lot of, not all the time, but oftentimes children who develop cancer might have had some genetic uh, susceptibility to divide, to getting that cancer. So they kind of were born with an increased likelihood of cancer to start with. Um, so that's why in this ALL, this acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is more common in children, often the original cause was some sort of chromosomal or genetic abnormality. Um, in fact, uh, children or patients with Down syndrome are especially susceptible to developing ALL. So that's acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The second is CLL. So it is C because it is chronic. So it is a slower progression. Um, so in ALL, it was all types of lymphocytes. So both B and T cell, but in CLL, it's just B cells. So it's just those B cell precursors or those lymphocytes, so B lymphocytes, I'm sorry. Um, because you have proliferation of immature B cells, they are never going to be B cells that are making antibodies. So that means, sure, you have a lot of B cells, but they're like funky cancerous B cells, and they never mature to make antibodies. So because of that, in CLL, you have decreased antibody projection. Um, because of that, you're going to have uh, immunosuppression. And then also you just have kind of a messed up B cell system. So it increases the likelihood of developing um, autoimmune antibodies that can damage other cell types in the body. Uh, CLL is the most common leukemia in the United States, um, and it is more common in males, and it is also more common in the elderly, because once again, it is chronic, so it's going to take years to develop. Anything that takes years to develop is going to be more common in someone who is older because they have had more years. Okay, so check for understanding. Leukemias are cancers present in Yes, remember, emia means blood, so leukemias are present in the blood and bone marrow. Very good. What type of leukemia is more common in children? So that is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL. Acute is sudden onset, whereas chronic is slow onset, takes years. Chronic is going to be more common in adults. Acute is more common in children. Chronic lymphoblastic leukemia is due to abnormal proliferation of what type of cells? Yeah, so remember CLL is just the B cells. ALL is all the lymphocytes, it's T and B. CLL is just B. So CLL, C, B. It's like almost the alphabet, but backwards? Sure. <laughs> okay, so that's leukemias. So we're going to move on to the other type of blood cancer, which are lymphomas. Um, so once again, lymphomas are blood cancers where the cancer cells are forming solid tissues or solid tumors in the lymph nodes. Um, so it's in the lymph nodes. So lymphomas have to do with abnormal pr proliferation of the cells that are normally found in the lymph nodes. So that would be lymphocytes. Um, so B cells, T cells, and those natural killer cells. About 3% of the U.S. population has or is diagnosed with a lymphoma every year. Um, interestingly, it is likely 
just based on epidemiological studies, that there's some sort of link between lymphomas and infection with Epstein-Barr virus. Um, you might remember that from module one, that EBV causes mononucleosis. Um, and that's true, but actually a lot of us are infected with Epstein-Barr and never have any symptoms at all. So um, people are trying to understand why is it that in some people, if they're infected with Epstein-Barr, it increases their likelihood of developing certain disorders later like lymphomas, and then in other people, it, it doesn't. Uh, we don't know that yet, but um, one reason why some people are suggesting we put more money into developing vaccines against Epstein-Barr virus, even though mononucleosis itself, which is like the classic disease cause of EBV, um, mono is not really that dangerous, but it's like the long-term effects of that EBV um, infection seem to be really, potentially really bad, so. And then for lymphomas, there are essentially two main types of lymphomas that you need to know. There are Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So let's start with Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, so Hodgkin's lymphoma is an abnormal pr proliferation of just B cells, so just B lymphocytes. And they are characterized by this very um, like unique type of cell called a Reed-Sternberg cell. Um, it's named after the, the physicians who first saw this under a microscope, essentially. So all these cells around here, these are normal cells. So like one cell and the dark part is a nucleus. So it's like one cell, one nucleus, one cell, one nucleus. And then look at this guy. He's huge. And inside there are two nuclei. Um, it almost kind of looks like a little, little eyeballs, right? Like a little face. Um, so these Reed Sternberg cells are binucleated, meaning they have two nuclei inside of them, abnormal, right? They're neoplastic, meaning they're cancer. Um, and some people say that they look like owl eyes. So this is a characteristic of um, Hodgkin's lymphoma. To be diagnosed, you would have to see this um, on like a blood smear. Um, Hodgkin's lymphoma is most common in young adults, so 15 to 35, and then adults over 55. Um, I'm sure you guys at this point have watched many Crash Course videos. Uh, so the host of Crash Course is Hank Green. Um, Hank Green actually was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma last year. Um, thankfully, since then, he has gone through chemotherapy and is now in remission. Um, but he's, I think he's probably in his 40s, but still, he's like uh, sort of a young, young male. So he fits the demographic of someone who develops Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and like I mentioned, that Epstein-Barr virus may play a role in the etiology, um, so the cause of developing that cancer. In addition to, like I said before, anything that increases the risk of mutations, um, and then also just age, because as you get older, you're just exposed to more things, um, that in general increases the risk of cancer. But um, sort of on top of that, it seems like specifically Epstein-Barr virus seems to also play a role. And then the other type of lymphoma is non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, so non-Hodgkin lymphoma um, is a lymphoma, a cancer of all types of B cells, or sorry, all lymphocytes, B cells, T cells, and uh, NK cells. Um, it's more common that it is a cancer specifically of B cells, but you can't see a non-Hodgkin lymphoma in any of those types of lymphocytes. Um, it's more common than Hodgkin lymphoma and it is more common in older adults and also in males. I don't, we don't know why a lot of the time some of these are more common in males or females, but for some reason, a lot of these um, blood cancers are more common in males. Um, oftentimes etiology, once again, can be reduced or connected to some viruses like Epstein-Barr virus or some other viruses. Um, and then also with chromosomal abnormalities. So chromosomal translocations, that is when like one piece of a chromosome breaks off and pops onto another piece. Um, there are some specific types of chromosomal translocations that can cause non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, these types of things would be things where you're not necessarily born with this. It probably is something that developed at some point during your life, which once again is why it's more common in someone who is older, because it just, if you have more years, it's just more likely that you get super unlucky and have a chromosomal translocation in a B cell. And then eventually that B cell goes on to become a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, so that's lymphoma. Check for understanding. What kind of lymphoma is characterized by the presence of Reed Sternberg cells, those owl eye cells? Yeah, so that is Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
Okay, so that is chapter 12, the blood cancers. I have a nice little summary table here for you as well. These are all the things you absolutely should know about these different types of blood cancers. So same thing, this would be a great thing to make some flashcards about because you should definitely know that, for example, like ALL is more common in children. You should know that Hodgkin lymphoma is associated with reed sternberg cells, et cetera. So definitely study, study this table. Okay, with that, let's move on to chapter 13. We're making great time. Chapter 13 is disorders of red blood cells. Um, so how many times am I show you this slide? A lot of times, apparently. Um, just a reminder, once again, all these blood cells are developing in the bone marrow where uh, this master stem cell then differentiates into one of these sort of intermediary stem cells. In this case, it would be a myeloid stem cell. Um, for red blood cells, that myeloid stem cell then differentiates into an erythroblast, which differentiates into a reticulocyte, which then becomes an erythrocyte, also known as a red blood cell. Um, that is important to remember as we are talking about issues with red blood cells, because if you see um, in sort of a, any abnormality in this whole pathway, that is just a, a hint that there's something going on with the red blood cell lineage. Um, specifically, this reticulocyte, those are I feel like less well-known cell types. Um, and it's good to remember that reticulocytes are the precursors to red blood cells. Okay, so red blood cells, I hope we all know this, but just a reminder of what they do. Um, once again, they're also called erythrocytes or corpuscules. No one wants to say that. We're gonna say red blood cells. Um, they mature from reticulocytes, like we said. And the purpose of red blood cells is to deliver oxygen to your tissues, right? Um, and they do that through the action of a protein called hemoglobin, which is the like functional protein of red blood cells. Hemoglobin is the protein that actually physically carries the oxygen um, within the red blood cell. Um, so that means there's two places where we can have problems with red, with oxygen delivery, right? So you can have like a problem with the red blood cell, maybe there's not enough of them or they're dying, or you could have a problem with the hemoglobin inside of the red blood cell. Either of those would cause uh, dysfunction in red blood cell function. That was repetitive. Okay, check for understanding. Uh, what is the function of red blood cells? Yep, so red blood cells carry and deliver oxygen to the tissues all throughout the body. So if we're talking about disorders of red blood cells, there's essentially two major types of disorders. We can have not enough, red blood cells, so that would be like an anemia, or we can have too many red blood cells, that would be polycythemia. Um, so we are only going to focus on anemias for this chapter. Um, so anemia is essentially inadequate delivery of oxygen to tissues, and that is due to some sort of pathology within the blood. So um, an inadequate number of red blood cells or those red blood cells are not healthy, essentially. Okay, so let's talk about anemias. So once again, anemia is defined as an insufficient oxygen delivery to the tissues due to a lack of normal red blood cells. So there's something wrong with the blood. Um, anemia is actually pretty common. Over 3 million people in the United States have some form of anemia, and it is more common in females. Uh, so about 12.4% of females have some kind of anemia. It's double the number of males. Um, why? It's because females lose blood every month uh, during menstruation, and that increases the risk of anemia. Uh, some possible causes or etiologies of anemias. So uh, once again, remember, anemia can be caused by something wrong with the blood cells, the red blood cells themselves, or something wrong with the hemoglobin inside of those red blood cells. Um, so for example, different etiologies, dysfunctional hemoglobin, so the hemoglobin is not carrying oxygen the way that it should, um, blood loss, if you just don't have enough blood, you are not going to have sufficient oxygen delivery to tissues. Hemolysis, hemo means blood, lysis means break. So this is destruction of red blood cells. Um, and then also nutritional deficiencies. Uh, this can be related to the first point because um, hemoglobin requires some very specific nutrients in order to work properly. So um, we're gonna go through some specific types of anemias, but for all of the anemias, they all have the same core signs and symptoms. And those signs and symptoms all have to do to hypoxia, which is decreased oxygenation. Um, so once again, anemia is insufficient delivery of oxygen to tissues. So your signs and symptoms are going to be due to hypoxia, not enough oxygen. 
Uh, so the first is pallor or paleness. So you're just not getting enough blood into your tissue, so you look pale. Second is fatigue. You need oxygen to make ATP to power your cells. If you don't have enough oxygen, you don't have enough ATP, that's gonna cause fatigue and weakness. Um, shortness of breath. Um, once again, that is because you have decreased oxygen. So you are going to compensate by, for that uh, by having shortness of breath. Um, heart palpitations and tachycardia. Once again, that is essentially like the body trying to compensate for the hypoxia by increasing the heart rate to try to like pump more blood to see if that fixes the problem. Um, chest pain can be related to that. Uh, dizziness, once again, due to that decreased oxygen delivery to the brain, and then also headache, decreased oxygen delivery to the brain. Okay, so once again, regardless of the type of anemia we are talking about, they all have um, the same core signs and symptoms. Okay, uh, so there's essentially three main categories of anemia. Uh, so the first are hemolytic anemias. So once again, hemo means blood and lysis means break. So these are anemias where red blood cells are being destroyed. This can be to due to genetic conditions, such as in sickle cell anemia. Um, it can be due to specific infections, uh, such as in like malaria, um, or it can be due to autoimmune disorders. Um, one example of an autoimmune disorder, and we'll talk about this one a little bit more in a second, is hemolytic disease of the newborn. You can also have anemias that are caused by nutritional deficiencies, so just at inadequate nutrients. Um, specific nutrients are required to make hemoglobin. So if you don't have those nutrients, your body can't make enough hemoglobin, and then that causes anemia. Classic example here is iron deficiency anemia. Um, hemoglobin requires iron in order to bind to oxygen and carry that oxygen throughout the body. So if you don't have enough iron, you don't have enough hemoglobin, now you have anemia. Um, and then you also can have anemia due to insufficient production of red blood cells. So this might be due to blood loss, um, either acute, so like a traumatic, like a car accident or something, a trauma, or chronic. So uh, this could be due to like heavy periods or like GI bleeding or something like that. Um, so blood loss can cause um, anemia. And then also cancer. So once again, remember, because the bone marrow is the place where all those blood cells are made, if you have a uh, blood cancer that is going to cause bone marrow suppression. So that can cause anemia because essentially the red blood cells are being crowded out within the bone marrow and there's just no space to make red blood cells. Okay. So fun fact, um, for hemolytic anemia, so once again, these are the anemias that are caused by destruction of red blood cells. A, a sign of hemolytic anemias is jaundice. Uh, so jaundice is like yellowing of the skin and eyes. And I feel like normally when we hear about jaundice, we think of liver problems. And yes, we will learn about liver disorders later and we'll learn about jaundice in that, um, that situation as well. It turns out that what causes jaundice is actually a, a buildup of a specific protein in the blood called bilirubin. Bilirubin is literally yellow. Um, so if you have too much bilirubin in your blood, then you are going to look yellow because you have like kind of yellowy blood. Uh, so where does this bilirubin come from? Um, it turns out that bilirubin is actually a breakdown product of hemoglobin. So when hemoglobin is broken down, it eventually makes this intermediate called bilirubin, and then that bilirubin should get excreted. Um, to excrete bilirubin, you need bile, um, because bilirubin is fat soluble, and bile is produced by the liver. So that's why jaundice is often associated with liver dysfunction. Um, but jaundice is also associated with hemolytic anemias because if you have increased breakdown of red blood cells, then you're going to release a bunch of hemoglobin into the bloodstream, which is going to cause an increase in bilirubin, and that causes jaundice. So, um, in babies, this can be really dangerous, um, and that's because in adults, usually jaundice itself, it's a, it can, it's a sign of something else going on, but jaundice itself is not usually dangerous. But in babies, it can be dangerous because um, in babies, that increased amount of bilirubin can cause brain damage, um, a, specific type, a specific type of brain damage called uh, kernicturus. And that is because um, more of the bilirubin can pass into the brain of an infant as opposed to an adult. And that is because the blood-brain barrier um, is not fully formed yet in an infant. Whereas in adults, you should have an intact blood-brain barrier and bilirubin can't pass that blood-brain barrier, but in an infant, it can. Um, so that's why jaundice can be dangerous um, in infants 
And essentially what happens is uh, that bilirubin can cross into the brain and then it uh, like just accumulates in specific places within the brain and then can um, damage those places in the brain. So um, I said jaundice in babies can cause that specific type of brain damage. Um, why would that happen? Uh, that could be because of hemolytic disease of the newborn, also cause, also called erythroblastosis vitalis. Uh, so hemolytic disease of the newborn, what it is, is um, the red blood cells in the baby are destroyed, so it's a hemolytic anemia, but it's actually because of antibodies that came from the mom. Um, so this is actually an example of a type 2 hypersensitivity, but it's like a weird combo of like mom and baby's immune systems working together. Um, it's a type 2 because we have antibodies binding to a specific cell and destroying them. So it's a cytotoxic uh, hypersensitivity. So what happens usually, uh, this would be someone who has, um, for example, if the mom, her blood type is negative, so like O negative, A negative, something like that. Uh, the negative means that uh, she does not have RH factor, which is just a specific protein in her body. Um, if the baby is positive, so like O positive, uh, the baby does have that protein. So that means that um, during uh, mixing of the blood from the fetus and from the mother, the mother can actually develop antibodies against that RH factor. Um, usually that mixing happens during childbirth. So oftentimes the first pregnancy is not a problem, but then it can be a bigger problem in a second pregnancy having those, those antibodies. Um, so in hemolytic disease of the newborn, the symptoms are in the infant, not in the parent. Um, and that's because once again, those antibodies are crossing the placenta, going into the um, fetus, and then actually destroying red blood cells within the fetus, not within the mother. Uh, but either way, you have destruction of red blood cells, which is going to release extra hemoglobin, which breaks down into bilirubin. So that's why you get jaundice, uh, also called, called hyperbilirubinemia. Um, you can also have other uh, signs and symptoms related to the breakdown of red blood cells. So enlarged liver, hepatomegaly, enlarged spleen, splenomegaly. And then once again, that high bilirubin at birth can lead to that specific type of brain damage. Um, but the good news is you can actually treat the high bilirubin fairly routinely with phototherapy. Um, so essentially just light is used to help break down the bilirubin, that excess bilirubin, and destroy it. And then uh, the baby's body is able to just kind of pass the broken down bilirubin. And because the, the original causative agent in hemolytic disease of the newborn are these antibodies from the mom, those antibodies don't last forever. Um, so you can just help treat the infant with this phototherapy. And then once those antibodies all go away, then you won't need the phototherapy anymore. So usually it's only something that um, needs to be a concern in the first uh, few weeks of life. Okay, check for understanding. Why is phototherapy uses a treatment for hemolytic disease of the newborn. Uh, so it's because phototherapy helps break down bilirubin and that high bilirubin causes jaundice, which can cause that specific type of brain damage and it can be dangerous. Okay, so our second type of hemolytic anemia is sickle cell anemia. Um, so sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder. Um, it is more common in specific uh, demographics. So this is Specifically, it is more common in those of African, Middle Eastern, and Mediterranean ancestry. I'll talk about that why or why that is in just a second. Um, but once again, it is a genetic disease. It is autosomal recessive, meaning the only way you can have sickle cell anemia is if you get a copy of the sickle cell um, gene from both parents. So what happens is the mutated version of the gene, it's actually uh, the gene for hemoglobin. Um, that hemoglobin actually clumps together and forms these big fibers and that causes the red blood cells to sickle and then lice destroy or break apart. Um, so it's an example of a hemolytic anemia. Um, so here's a nice little pedigree showing potential transmission of uh, sickle cell disease through a family. So here we have a dad and a mom. And notice that they're both carriers because they have half shaded in symbols. Um, and some of their children might have sickle cell disease. So the only way someone can have sickle cell is if either both of their parents are carriers or one parent was a carrier and another parent had sickle cell in the first place. Um, this type of a situation where you had like someone without 
any sickle cell allele, so they only have normal hemoglobin, and someone who is a carrier. Um, some of their children could be carriers, but no one would specifically have two copies, so no one would have sickle cell anemia. Um, so I said before that sickle cell is more common in those of African, Middle Eastern, and Mediterranean ancestry. So why is that? Um, it's actually for a very interesting reason, um, and that's because people who are carriers are actually protected from malaria. So this is something called heterozygote advantage, where having one copy of this mutated allele actually provides an advantage over not having it at all. Um, so why is sickle cell more common in these demographics? It's because these are the places in the world where malaria is more common. Um, so that's why over time, evolutionarily, the gene for sickle cells sticked around in these locations because it was actually advantageous to have one copy of the sickle cell trait. So just an interesting fact. Okay, so signs and symptoms of sickle cell anemia. Once again, you'll have all the normal, or the, I shouldn't say normal, just all the usual signs and symptoms of anemia. So um, fatigue, pallor, weakness, all that stuff that is related to hypoxia. Um, but then in addition to that, sickle cell actually has a very specific sign that um, is uh, unique to sickle cell. And those are called vaso-occlusive episodes. Um, and that's because those sickled cells are very rigid because of those clumps of hemoglobin that form these fibers. And in capillaries, those sickle cells, um, those sickled red blood cells can actually form clumps and block blood flow. So they can cause little tiny like micro ischemias. Um, so because of that, you have no blood flow getting to that tissue. So that's gonna be really painful. So essentially um, someone who's having a vaso-occlusive episode, they also call those pain attacks. It's like an incredibly, incredibly painful episode. Um, depending on where those clumps are, it can also cause a stroke, an ischemic stroke, which is a lack of blood flow to the brain, or it can even cause a myocardial infarction, which is essentially a heart attack. Um, and these two things, a stroke and a heart attack, those are usually things we associate with age. So with people who are more elderly, but in people with sickle cell, because you just, you know, if you have a vaso-occlusive episode, it's just because these sickle cells are clumping up together, you actually see um, a higher incidence of things like stroke and heart attack in children who have sickle cell, which is really sad. Um, interestingly, in the news right now, there's been a lot of talk about sickle cell because um, there are some gene therapies that have been recently developed for sickle cells. So these are therapies where um, they're using different mechanisms, but one of them uses CRISPR to essentially um, take the stem cells from someone who has sickle cell and use CRISPR to uh, like remove the mutated genes and like fix them with or replace them kind of with normal hemoglobin genes. So this cures sickle cell. Um, which is really exciting. So uh, the first patient who undergot, went one of these gene, this new gene therapy just underwent treatment, I think in like May of 2024, and then just last week um, was able to, to leave the hospital. And so it was the first patient to be treated with this new, this new therapy. And he's, he's only 12, so really interesting. All right, so those were our two hemolytic anemias, uh, hemolytic disease of the newborn and sickle cell. Uh, we're moving on to the next category, which is anemia due to blood loss. Um, specifically, anemia due to acute blood loss is usually is due to some sort of trauma, um, or it could be due to uh, someone who has a bleeding disorder, meaning just naturally their blood doesn't clot enough, so they're prone to bleeding more than they should. Um, signs and symptoms of anemia due to acute blood loss are dependent on the loss, how much blood is lost. Once again, you have the classic anemia signs and symptoms, fatigue, pallor, all of that. But in addition, if you have really severe blood loss, so more than 40%, you have a whole nother range of symptoms that are actually due to the loss of blood volume. So yes, it is an anemia. You have decreased oxygenation of the tissues, but if you lost a ton of blood, you also have hypovolemia. So just decreased blood volume. So if you have decreased blood volume, hypovolemia, that is going to cause really low blood pressure. Um, and because of that, the body will try to compensate for that low blood pressure. So the uh, compensatory mechanisms you'll see are tachycardia or elevated heart rate. Um, remember heart rate, or sorry, blood pressure, we'll get to this later in this module, but blood pressure is a combination of things like 
your heart rate, the amount of blood volume, the resistance of arteries and things like that. So if you have low blood pressure due to um, loss, of, loss of blood volume, one of the things your body can do to compensate is increase the heart rate to try to increase that blood pressure back to normal. Decreased urine output. Once again, you have low blood volume, so your body's trying to hold on to fluids. So you're going to stop peeing those fluid out. You're going to keep as much fluid as you can in your body to treat that low um, blood pressure, to treat the hypovolemia. Excessive thirst. Once again, trying to get fluid into your body. Um, and then it turns out that uh, fluid retention, so the decreased urine output and the excessive thirst, you're increasing the amount of fluid in the blood, but you're not necessarily like replacing the red blood cells that have been lost. So you can actually see dilutional um, decreased hematocrit, which is a measure of how much hemoglobin or how many red blood cells essentially, essentially are in the blood. Um, and that's because it takes a little while to make red blood cells, right? But you can chug a bunch of water really quick and increase some of your blood volume. Um, so you're gonna dilute out the proportion of red blood cells. So someone who has anemia of acute blood loss, their signs and symptoms might be you know, tachycardia, and then also decreased hematocrit, so less red blood cells, which might feel a little counterintuitive because you're like, well, they just lost blood. Why would it decrease red blood cells? It's because of this fluid retention that is secondary to the loss of blood. Okay, check for understanding. Which would you not expect to see in a patient with anemia of acute blood loss? Okay, so once again, Acute blood loss means we are losing a ton of blood volumes. So that's going to cause hypovolemia. Hypovolemia causes hypotension, low blood pressure. And then that's going to kick off a bunch of compensatory mechanisms. So you're going to see things that have to do with trying to raise the blood pressure because that's the compensatory stuff, as well as your classic signs and symptoms of anemia. So pallor, that's a classic sign and symptom. You would expect to see that. Fast heart rate, that's a compensatory mechanism to try to make up for the low blood pressure. Hemodilution, remember that's due to the increased fluid retention, which is a compensatory mechanism. High blood pressure, no. If you have acute blood loss, blood loss you have low blood pressure because you just lost a bunch of blood. You don't have high blood pressure. And then decreased urine output, yes, that's another compensatory mechanism. Oh, that's the answer. There you go. Okay, now moving on to nutritional deficiency anemias. This is where we get to the most common cause of anemia worldwide, which is iron deficiency anemia. Um, it's estimated that about 50% of people in underdeveloped countries have iron deficiency anemia, and some around 10% of people in developed countries. <coughs> Once again, iron deficiency anemia is more common in females. That's because of menstruation. Um, and then also due to things like pregnancy, breastfeeding, all of that um, increases the susceptibility to iron deficiency anemia. Uh, estimated somewhere between 15 to 45 percent of women between 20 and 45 years of age have iron deficiency anemia. Why is this such a broad range? Um, it's because if your symptoms are mild, you might not necessarily go to get um, diagnosed. So it's probably underdiagnosed. So treatment address the iron deficiency. Uh, so you can take Iron supplementation, so um, oral meaning by mouth, ferrous sulfate, ferrous is another word for iron, um, or if that does not work, you can also get um, an IV that has iron in it. Um, and then in order to absorb iron in your stomach, you need vitamin C, uh, so you can also take vitamin C supplements. So signs and symptoms of iron deficiency anemia, of course, you are gonna have, once again, all of the classic anemia signs and symptoms, pallor, fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath, that kind of stuff. But then in addition, you also have extra um, signs and symptoms with iron deficiency anemia that are more specific. Um, the first one I think is the most characteristic, which is pica, um, which is the craving to eat non-food items like ice. I'm sure we've all heard that people you know, say something like, oh, if you like to chew on ice, it means you have anemia. That is the genesis of, of that statement. Um, and supp supposedly that's because if you are, maybe if you're deficient in iron, your body's like, I don't know, eat some dirt. Um, so that's why you start to crave non food items. Um, hair loss, uh, these specific uh, signs called chelitis and glossitis, and then spoon-shaped nails. All of these are due to um, the low iron in the blood. So iron is needed to make hemoglobin. Iron is also needed to make a similar 
pro or like another protein in the same family called myoglobin. Um, and myoglobin is really important for muscle formation and specifically um, muscles in the tongue and in the mouth are affected by this lack of myoglobin. And that's why you see this like redamine and kind of like swelling of the tongue or around the lips. Uh, so the tongue is glossitis and then uh, sort of this like redness around the lips is chilitis. Check for understanding. What is the most common cause for anemia worldwide? Iron deficiency anemia. You got it. A characteristic symptom for iron deficiency anemia is pica, pica. Uh, what is pica? That is the desire to eat non-food items. Okay, excellent. We did it. Whew. So we're moving right along. Up next is chapter 14 which is disorders of platelets, hemostasis, and coagulation. Um, so hemostasis, once again, hemo means blood, stasis means to stop. So hemostasis is essentially blood clotting. Um, the point of hemostasis is to make a thrombus, which is a fancy word for a blood clot. There are two components of a thrombus. There are, is the uh, platelet plug and the fibrin mesh. So an analogy I like to use to explain a thrombus is a brick wall. Um, a brick wall has two parts, right? It has the bricks, the bricks and the mortar. If you build a wall of just bricks or you tried to build a wall of just mortar, it wouldn't be nearly as strong. You need both of those things. You need the bricks, the platelets, and the mortar, the fibrin that connects the platelets. Um, so how are these two components, the platelets and the fibrin, um, brought together? Uh, so the platelets get activated and start to clump together um, mostly by endothelial damage. So mostly by um, damage to blood vessels. So if a blood vessel busts open, it's gonna release some chemicals and different proteins and things like that. And that um, will activate the platelets. Whereas the fibrin mesh is created by something called the coagulation cascade, which is this very complex uh, series of enzymatic reactions that at the end makes fibrin. Um, so, Blood clotting is super complex. It's super tightly regulated by a bunch of proteins in your body. Um, so you have natural anticoagulants, so things that stop your blood from clotting too much. For example, naturally, your body has something called heparin that prevents blood clotting. Um, heparin is also administered in the hospital to prevent blood clotting. Um, it's just the same molecule that is synthetically made or derived from animal products, depending on the type of heparin. Um, and then your body also has natural procoagulants. The most common procoagulant is called thrombin, which is just a protein that is important for making the fibrin mesh. Okay, so we're gonna watch this short um, video, which is just a quick little animation of um, the two parts of hemostasis. And I think it helps because this is a fairly complex process. So watching a, a video of it is just helps to give you some context. At the site of vessel injury, the first platelets arrive to start sealing the wound. Simultaneously, the coagulation cascade with its various coagulation factors is activated. This involves two pathways, the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway. Extrinsic activation begins with now exposed molecules of the vessel wall, such as tissue factor, which forms a complex with factor 7 finally leading to the activation of factor 10. This factor 10A is the point at which the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways of the coagulation cascade meet. The intrinsic pathway consists of various coagulation factors activating each other in a chain reaction. At its end, a complex with an additional cofactor is formed. This complex now activates factor 10. Since the two pathways merge at the level of factor 10A, this factor has a pivotal role in the coagulation cascade. Further down the cascade, factor 10A, in combination with 5A, activates thrombin and induces the so-called thrombin burst. One molecule of factor 10A can catalyze the formation of a thousand molecules of thrombin. 
these large amounts of thrombin cause the further activation of platelets and the enhanced formation of fibrin. Fibrin then forms strands, making up the mesh that stabilizes the platelet plug in an arterial clot and holds together the red blood cells in a venous clot. It can be concluded that the central role of factor 10A in the coagulation cascade makes it a viable target for therapeutic intervention in pathologically altered blood coagulation. Cool. The last part I think is the most important part. So knowing that um, factor 10 is sort of like key in hemostasis is good to know because there's a bunch of medications that um, target factor 10 are and these are sort of like new blood thinners. Um, of course, this is not pharmacology, so you don't need to know any of those medications, but I still want you guys to know that factor 10 is super important for blood clotting. So when you get to pharmacology, you are prepared for that. Okay. Um, so in that video, and then what we said previously, we have platelets and we have the fiber and mesh, right? So platelets are the bricks in the blood clot. Uh, platelets are also called thrombocytes. Uh, thrombo means blood clot. So these are blood clot cells. Um, platelets are a kind of a type of white blood cell. Technically, platelets are not cells. They are cell fragments. They are produced from a cell called megakaryocytes. And then the megakaryocytes kind of like bleb off little pieces. And those little pieces are called platelets. Um, oftentimes, people kind of refer to them as cells, though, because they're cell-like. But technically, they are not um, cells. And then uh, once again, the fibrin mesh is made through activation of the coagulation cascade. Do you need to know this? No, don't panic. It looks so complicated. It is complicated. Um, but he talked about this in the video. So there's two uh, arms of the coagulation cascade. So essentially, you can start making that fiber mesh through two different ways. Um, you have the intrinsic pathway and then the ex extrinsic pathway. Ugh, what does that mean? It doesn't really matter. All that I want you to remember is that the intersection of those two is factor 10. So factor 10 is the one that's sort of like the most important part of the coagulation cascade, factor 10 activates thrombin, and then thrombin actually makes that fibrin clot and also helps activate platelets. So these are sort of like the three big players, factor 10 activates thrombin, which can activate a fibrin clot. Um, so I said, don't worry about this too much. So why am I even showing it to you? And it's because specifically of this part right here. Um, so we can measure activity of the intrinsic pathway with a specific laboratory assay called a a partial thromboplastin time or an APTT. Uh, so an APTT measures the intrinsic pathway, whereas a prothrombin time or a PT measures the extrinsic pathway. So these are two different laboratory assays that can assess essentially how well the coagulation cascade is working. Um, this is important for multiple reasons. It can be used to diagnose if someone has a bleeding disorder or um, a propensity for clotting too much. It is also often used to track someone who is on anticoagulants, so who's on blood thinners, to make sure that the amount of medication they are receiving is the right amount of medication. Because you want to, if you're on a blood thinner, you want to give them just the right amount to decrease the risk of clotting, but you don't want to give them too much because then that's going to make them bleed, and that's also really bad. Okay, so like I said, um, so the the PT and the APTT are both examples of laboratory tests that have to do with blood clotting. Um, there's also laboratory tests that specifically can assess platelet function. Um, so easiest would be a platelet count. How many platelets are there? Um, there's also a platelet function assay, which is called a PFA, which is like, sure, you might have the normal number of platelets, but maybe the platelets themselves are abnormal and not working normally. Um, and then an older assay is called a bleeding time which literally someone would just like cut you and see how long, how long it took for you to stop bleeding. Um, and then they'd be like, oh, it took a really long time. So I guess you must have a bleeding disorder. That's how things used to be. Um, so that's more for platelet function, for coagulation factor function. So for the um, making the fibrin mesh part and the, the coag cascade, we have the PT and the PTT. So once again, the PT measures the intrinsic pathway, the PTT measures the intrinsic pathway, and then a ratio of these two is called an INR. 
Um, and then this is something that is used to monitor anticoagulants. So someone who is on blood thinners, especially a specific blood thinner called warfarin um, or Coumadin, which is a very common blood thinner, but it's also kind of like finicky. So people, um, when they first start taking warfarin are gonna have to come in a lot to get their INR monitored to make sure they're getting just the right amount of anticoagulant. Okay, check for understanding. What kind of lab test is used to assess coagulation factor function? Yeah, so remember coagulation factors, those are the fiber and mesh, they're the mortar, they're not the brooks, it's not the platelets. So a platelet count, that would be used to measure platelets. So it must be the other answer, a <laughs> PTT. So uh, PT and PTT, those are the two laboratory tests to measure coagulation factor function. Okay, um, so abnormalities in platelets. Um, so once again, platelets are the bricks, they're really important for forming blood clots. Um, so you can have essentially two problems with platelets. You can have not enough of them or too many. So not enough platelets, that would be thrombocytopenia. Remember, penia means decrease. Uh, this is uh, defined as less than 100,000 platelets per microliter. So that would be on a platelet count. Um, if you don't have enough platelets, it means that your blood is having a hard time clotting. So in other words, you are at risk of bleeding. So signs and symptoms of thrombocytopenia would be uh, petechia, which are those little pinprick looking bruises things, um, purpura, those are also little pin pricky bruises, epistaxis, which is nose bleeding, um, gums, gingiv gingival, sure, bleeding, gum bleeding. So pretty much like bleeding in your mucous membranes. Um, three main causes of thrombocytopedias, uh, not making enough platelets, uh, platelets being destroyed, or something wrong with just how the platelets are getting distributed throughout the blood, maybe they're getting stuck somewhere. And then uh, on the flip side, you can have too many platelets. So that's thrombocytosis. So that'd be more than 750,000 platelets per microliter. Um, so this would just be the opposite. So if you have too many platelets, that puts you at risk of clotting. So um, forming blood clots when you shouldn't. Uh, so things that cause uh, thrombocytosis are polycythemia, which is um, once again, that like increased uh, red blood cells. Um, certain types of cancer. So if you have a cancer in the lineage that makes um, thrombocytes, so um, that can increase the genesis of platelets that can cause thrombocytosis. Um, cancers, uh, sorry, some infections can also cause thrombocytosis and then also inflammation. Okay. Um, and then coagulopathy. So this is the category of things that have to do with the coagulation cascade. So the proteins that are involved in making the fiber and mesh and making the mortar. So hypercoagulability, hyper means too much. So this is too much coagulation, too much blood clotting. So people who have hypercoagulability are at risk of blood clots, of thrombus. So um, some examples of uh, problems that can occur if you have hypercoagulability would be like a DVT, which is a deep vein thrombosis, um, a pulmonary embolism, um, or an ischemic strokes. These are all things that can happen to someone who is in a hypercoagulable state. Many causes of hypercoagulability. Um, the most common is an autoimmune disease called antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, also very common is increased estrogen. So anything that increases estrogen increases the risk of uh, blood clotting. Um, so that could be from pregnancy. Um, it could be someone who's postpartum um, or also taking oral contraceptives that contain estrogen. Um, there's also some genetic risk factors. So there is a specific uh, mutation in one of the coagulation cascade proteins called factor V Leiden. Uh, so factor V Leiden is a, a genetic hypercoagulability. There's some other ones as well. Um, and then some types of cancer can also contribute to hypercoagulability. Flip side, hypocoagulability, so not clotting enough. Um, so this would increase your risk of bleeding. So if you are bleeding too much, that could cause hematomas, which are essentially like uh, bumps, like if you get like a head bump and it gets all, you know, swollen, that's a hematoma. Uh, petechia, purpura, bleeding gums, nosebleeds, hemorrhagic stroke. So a stroke that's like a brain bleed. Uh, causes of hypocoagulability, uh, genetic disorders like hemophilia, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, thrombocytopenia can also contribute to hypocoagulability, so decreased platelets. Um, and then also cancer. So confusingly, cancer can cause either one. Just depends on what that cancer is doing. And then also vitamin K deficiency. 
Um, so vitamin K is really important in the coagulation cascade. If you don't have enough vitamin K, it causes, um, it decreases blood clotting. In fact, I was talking before about that anticoagulant Coumadin or Warfarin. Um, the way Warfarin works is it essentially is a vitamin K antagonist. So it like decreases the amount of vitamin K in your body. Um, this is also why newborns uh, receive vitamin K shots. It's because vitamin K deficiency is something that happens um, just kind of randomly in some newborns. It's as many as 50% of infants may um, be born with some sort of vitamin K deficiency. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have a bleeding problem, but um, essentially having a little bit, having a dose of vitamin K at birth just decreases the risk of that causing any sort of issue. So that's why um, babies are administered vitamin K at birth to prevent any sort of bleeding problems. Okay, check for understanding. A patient with thrombocytopenia would be expected to be at risk for what? Okay, so thrombocytes, those are platelets, and then penia means decrease. So if you don't have enough platelets, you can't make blood clots, right? So in other words, that is going to be an increased risk of bleeding because you can't make blood clots. So opposite of clotting, bleeding. Okay, so um, we're just gonna talk about a couple specific diseases and disorders that are related to issues with platelets and with blood clotting. Uh, the first is one we touched on way back when, when we were talking about uh, different types of hypersensitivities and that's immune thrombocytopenic purpura or ITP. ITP is a type of type two hypersensitivity. So it's a cytotoxic hypersensitivity where um, an antibody is binding to platelets and then destroying those platelets. Um, the name itself helps you remember that. So it's immune because of those antibodies. Thrombocytopenic, we are destroying platelets. And then purpura, that uh, tells you about the classic sign, which are these um, bruise-like little dots that appear on the skin. So how does ITP happen? Usually it's because you have these antibodies floating around your blood um, and those antibodies were being used to fight a viral infection and then the antibody sort of collateral damage uh, some of the platelets. So it's almost like friendly fire. Um, so usually this occurs after uh, a viral infection um, or it can also occur in people who have autoimmune diseases um, like lupus. So signs and symptoms, once again, are due to that increased risk of bleeding due to the thrombocytopenia. So uh, the purpura, easy bruising, heavy periods, um, epistaxis, which is no squeeze. Um, okay, then the next disease or disorder is hemophilia. Um, so hemophilia is um, an X-linked recessive disorder. Uh, it turns out that the gene to make a lot of blood, or the genes to make many blood clotting proteins are carried on the X chromosome. Um, so because of that, hemophilia is much more common in males because males only have one X chromosome. Um, so what happens in people with hemophilia, there is a mutation um, that essentially decreases the amount of a specific coagulation proteins or makes them just not work normally. There's different types of hemophilia. So hemophilia A is caused by a mutation in a protein called factor eight, and hemophilia B is caused by a mutation in a protein called factor nine. Essentially, those mutations cause deficiencies. Um, so someone who has hemophilia A has factor eight deficiency. Hemophilia B is factor nine deficiency. Um, so I think there's a perception that someone with hemophilia like can die from a paper cut or something like that. Um, that's not really true. Um, if someone who has hemophilia got in like a car accident or had a trauma, yes, that would be highly dangerous, right? I mean, trauma is dangerous for everyone, but it, it is worse if you have hemophilia. Um, but really kind of like day to day, a big impact of hemophilia is um, has to do with the joints. So essentially people with hemophilia, especially boys, um, have these recurrent bleeds in their joints and think they're like little boys. So they're running around, you know, living their life and that's hard on your joints. And actually that can cause just like micro damage and in a normal person, it doesn't cause any issues. But in someone who is prone to bleeding, who has hemophilia can actually cause bleeding into the joints. Um, so as you can see, that looks incredibly painful. <laughs> um, and then over time, that chronic bleeding into the joints can cause really, really severe, essentially arthritis. Um, it can be debilitating in um, essentially like as early as their 20s. Um, but the good news is now most boys with hemophilia are treated um, with factor replacement. So essentially they just take medicine that is whatever protein they're missing. They just take like a little dose of it every day and it brings them back up to more of like a normal amount 
of that protein and then it prevents those joint bleeds and they can live, um, you know, pretty, pretty normal lives. In fact, I actually uh, worked with someone who had hemophilia. So uh, this guy right here was one of my coworkers when I used to work in a, a lab, like I said, that studied bleeding disorders. And um, he has severe hemophilia B. And he actually was the first person with hemophilia to uh, climb the seven summits, meaning he climbed the highest mountain in all seven continents, including Mount Everest. Um, and there's actually a documentary about him, which is super cool. Um, and now he does advocacy work about hemophilia and like helping spread awareness and raise money for um, boys who have hemophilia in developing countries to pay for the factor replacement because it's really expensive. Okay, so those are two examples of bleeding disorders, ITP and hemophilia. Um, and like I said, there are some hypercoagulabilities. So um, instances where you can have uh, like too much clotting. So the blood is too sensitive and prone to clotting. Like I said, there are hereditary causes like factor V Leiden, which is just um, a specific mutation that makes you more likely to have blood clots. Doesn't mean your blood's clotting all the time, just means you're just more prone than someone else who doesn't have that mutation. Um, there's also a lot of acquired causes. The most common is definitely pregnancy. Um, so this picture here is uh, a graph essentially showing blood clotting over time. So here's the normal person. So like the clot forms and then it breaks down. This is a pregnant person. <laughs> Whoa, look at how much more uh, blood clotting is present in someone who is pregnant. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because um, birth is super traumatic to the body and it's a lot of blood loss potentially. So you kind of need um, a hypercoagulability to prevent uh, the risk of extreme blood loss. Um, but that comes along with other other risks as well, of course. Um, similarly, things that increase estrogens also cause hypercoagulability because sort of we have this built-in mechanism to increase hyper or to increase coagulation during pregnancy. So things that kind of look like pregnancy, like hormones, also increase um, coagulability. So uh, for some types of birth control, estrogen containing birth control um, can also increase coagulability. And then, like I mentioned before, cancer. And then antiphospholipid syndrome, which is just another um, type of um, autoimmune disorder. So for all of those hypercoagulabilities, one of the big concerns is development of a deep vein thrombosis. So this is a blood clot within a deep vein, um, usually a vein in the legs. Uh, so the reason that DVTs are dangerous is one, it can obviously cause issues in the legs. Uh, two, it's very painful. Um, but three, the real big concern is if this blood clot breaks off and moves um, and it goes through the heart and then into the lungs, that can cause a pulmonary embolism um, or a PE. So essentially in pulmonary embolism is like a blood clot that has moved into the lungs and then it's going to affect lung function. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about DVT in the next um, module as well, but there are three risk factors for DVT. And the first is hypercoagulability. So these would be things like what we just talked about, factor V Leiden, um, like cancer, pregnancy, et cetera. All of these things put someone in a hypercoagulable state. And that is one of the parts of Furchow's, Furchow's triad. The other two parts are endothelial damage. Um, so for example, if you have high blood pressure or you smoke, that uh, increases the likelihood of making blood clots because the normal function of platelets is to, they see a damaged blood vessel is to be like, ah, form a clot, we're bleeding you know, our blood vessel has been damaged, put a clot there, but uh, if it's not actually damaged, it's just looks damaged because of smoking or hypertension, then that increases the risk of forming a blood clot. Um, and then the other part of the triad is stasis, meaning just not moving the blood around. Um, blood that pools and just kind of sits there tends to clot. It's like, think of, it tends to just like coagulate if it's sitting there. Um, so stasis would be like immobility. So um, this is the reason why after like surgery, orthopedic surgery, um, you're at high risk for blood clots. It's because oftentimes you have to you know, be on bed rest for a little while to recover from that surgery. So the most common um, risk for DVT is orthopedic surgery. Okay. So check for understanding. What are the three categories of risk factors that comprise the Verkaus triad, um, which describe increased risk of deep vein thrombosis? Yeah, so those three things would be hypercoagulability, which are all the things we just talked about in this chapter, vascular injury, and then venous stasis. 
we're almost done. All right, so that takes us to chapter 15, arterial disorder. So disorders of the arteries. Uh, so just a little reminder, what are arteries? So arteries are blood vessels. Um, specifically, arteries are muscular. So um, they're innervated and they have smooth muscle around them and they have the ability to sort of uh, dilate and uh, expand. Remember that arteries move blood away, arteries away, move blood away from the heart. Um, and because of that, they are high pressure vessels, meaning the heart is pumping blood and the blood gets pumped into the arteries first. So they are sort of getting the immediate effect of that very strong heart pumping the blood in there. So um, that can, or that is what puts pressure on the arteries. And then sort of at the same time, the arteries themselves, if they get narrower, that puts excess strain on the heart because now the heart has to pump against this little tiny skinny um, opening and that increases the load on the heart. We'll talk more about that next week when we talk about um, just heart related diseases and disorders. So in terms of um, arterial disorders, they are mostly having to do with arteriosclerosis. So arteo meaning artery and then sclerosis meaning hardening. So this is a hardening, a hardening <laughs> of the arteries. Um, specifically, a type of arterial sclerosis is atherosclerosis. I know those words like are almost the exact same word. Who came up with that terminology? The worst. Um, but atherosclerosis, I feel like, is what we think of when we hear of arterial sclerosis, which is uh, like plaque building up within arteries. Um, so this is essentially like why cholesterol is bad is because we it increases the likelihood of plaque building up within your arteries. Um, arteries that are get more of that high pressure, so they're like closer to the heart and therefore they just kind of getting like bombarded with pressure, are more susceptible to arterial sclerosis. And also narrow arteries are also more susceptible. So this would include like the aorta, the coronary arteries, which are the arteries that feed the heart itself, um, and the carotid artery. So um, atherosclerosis, how does it actually form? What is the etiology here? So it all starts with some sort of initial endothelial injury. So once again, this could be because of increased pressure on those vessels, um, just like sheer force causing some endothelial damage. It could be due to like smoking or something else that's just causing a little bit of angriness in that um, artery, in that endothelium. So because you have a little bit of damage, that's gonna cause inflammation. Um, it's like a little injury, right? So part of the inflammatory response is to recruit white blood cells to the site of injury. So some of the cells that are recruited to that injury are going to be platelets and also macrophages because platelets and macrophages are part of the white blood cell family. So those macrophages, um, macrophages, they're a type of white blood cell that like to eat stuff. That is their normal function. They usually should be eating pathogens to protect you. Um, but in this case, they're getting recruited to this endothelial, this um, artery that hasn't actually really been injured. It just like, like there's no hole or anything there. So the macrophage is like, oh, what should I eat? I don't know. And if it sees a lot of these LDL particles, it can start to eat those. Um, so what is LDL? It stands for low density lipoprotein. And they're essentially just little packages, little vesicles of fat. Specifically, they contain a lot of cholesterol. So this is where that connection to cholesterol comes in. If you have a lot of cholesterol, um, you tend to have a lot of these little fat particles in your blood. There's different types of particles. LDL is the one that is um, most likely to cause atherosclerosis because the macrophages come along and eat those LDL particles. When that happens, those macrophages essentially get all full of these little fat particles and now they're called foam cells because they literally look foamy. Um, this like fatty macrophage is not, not healthy, not happy. Um, that foam cell is going to die. Um, these cells can die by either apoptosis or necrosis. Um, if it's necrosis, obviously it's just exploding and that's gonna cause even more inflammation. And oh my gosh, it's just making the process even worse, right? So inflammation is gonna recruit recruit platelets and macrophages who just keep doing the same thing. Um, so uh, along with these macrophages, when you have those platelets also, they're also gonna like bind to the surface of those arteries and then the combo of platelets and then these dead um, foam cells kind of build up along the walls of the artery and become something called a plaque, which is just like a clump of these fatty cells and platelets that's just like building up 
within the artery. Um, so those plaques can get bigger and bigger and bigger. They can become so big that they actually completely occlude the um, blood vessel itself, or the plaques can actually just break off because it's like this fatty, crumbly substance and blood is flowing past it all the time. So um, that happens over enough time, the plaque can actually just, you know, a clump of it can fall off and then travel to another place in the body. If that plaque travels to a blood vessel that is more narrow, it is going to occlude that blood vessel and cause ischemia. Um, in that case, that would be called an embolism when the plaque moves to somewhere else. Um, same thing if the plaque moves to the lungs and causes an embolism there, that's called a pulmonary embolism, which can cause breathing problems. If the plaque moves to a coronary artery um, or the coronary blood flow, that can cause a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. If the plaque moves to a <laughs> circulatory system in the brain, that can cause decreased blood flow to the brain, which is called an ischemic stroke. Um, so that's essentially why atherosclerosis increases the risk of all these very serious diseases and disorders. It's because of this increased risk of these plaques, which can rupture and then become embolisms. So that's why oftentimes the treatment for atherosclerosis is decreasing cholesterol. So that can be through like um, dietary changes, lifestyle changes, or by taking medications like statins, which decrease cholesterol production in the body. Um, and you can also have people take uh, aspirin. Baby aspirin is a common medication prescribed for atherosclerosis because um, baby aspirin uh, essentially inhibits platelets. So it's just kind of helping to tamp down this whole process. Okay, so that's atherosclerosis, which is uh, the first arterial disorder. The next arterial disorder, and the only other one we are going to talk about is hypertension. Uh, so hypertension is essentially high blood pressure. You might be wondering, like, why is this in the arterial disorders? What? Um, it's because hypertension, high blood pressure, is often due to problems in the arteries. Because once again, arteries are flowing blood away from the heart, right? So the heart pumps blood into those arteries. So if the arteries are narrow, the heart has to push harder. So that's high, that causes high blood pressure because you're having to push harder, that's causing that increased blood pressure. Um, the increased blood pressure itself um, increases the like strain essentially, or like the, the force on the walls of the arteries. So that's why this is considered an arterial disorder because it can damage um, the arteries. So um, it's that one in two adults in the United States have hypertension, um, which is, sorry, uh, abbreviated as HTN. Um, but even though it's one in two is the estimation, it's likely that many people are undiagnosed. 90% um, of cases of hypertension are primary hypertension, meaning we don't know why people have it. Um, so it's not like they have some other, you know, something you can point out and be like, oh, this is why they have high blood pressure. We just don't know. Um, we do know that there's many things that increase the risk of developing high blood pressure. So the risk increases with age. It's more common in males. Um, it's more common in people who are obese, stress, all these different things. I think a lot of this, you're like, oh, yeah, that all seems to be associated with hypertension. But once again, we don't necessarily know why. We just know that those two things are linked to each other in some way. Um, diet, uh, sodium, and alcohol intake can also increase the risk of hypertension. That has to do with uh, like fluid retention, presumably, um, and then also lipids. So if you have um, atherosclerosis, which causes narrowing of the arteries, that is also going to contribute to high blood pressure. So how is high blood pressure diagnosed? Um, so uh, blood pressure is two components, right? You have systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So uh, systolic is the number on the top and diastolic is the number on the bottom. Um, normal would be 120 over 80, or it's 119, but that's like a weird number. Um, Prehypertension would be 120 to 140, and then hypertension would would be officially diagnosed with um, a blood pressure of 140. Sorry, 140 over 100 or higher. 140 over 90 or higher. Sorry. Okay. So, um, why is high blood pressure bad? Uh, there's potentially a number of problems that can occur because of high blood pressure. Um, so first, like I said, you have more stress on the walls of the arteries themselves, just because there's more press, literally more force is being pushed against those arteries. So we call that sheer stress, essentially like 
the force of the blood rushing past those arteries can harm the arteries themselves. Um, so that can essentially cause arterial damage. So you can see that um, in places like the retinas, um, in the kidneys, in the brain. Um, so for example, <clears throat> this is a picture of someone with a normal retina. This is a picture of someone who has had um, untreated hypertension for a long period of time. And you can see that in this retina, there are just a lot of, um, or there's fewer vessels and the retina just looks less healthy overall. And you have a lot of these like little micro damages, um, whereas here everything is nice and defined. Another potential effect of hypertension um, is left ventricular hypertrophy. Oh, sorry. Uh, so hypertrophy, remember, means the cells are getting bigger. Um, usually we talk about hypertrophy in the context of a muscle. In this case, we're talking about it in the context of the left ventricle, so the left side of the heart. Um, this would be an example of pathological hypertrophy. So the heart muscle is getting bigger, but not in a healthy way. Um, so the heart is beating harder to pump blood through that, you know, through the increased blood pressure. So the heart's having to work really hard. Um, and in doing so, it's going to cause, um, it's increasing metabolic demand of the cells in the left ventricle, which is why they become hypertrophic but it is not done in a healthy way, like slowly over time. And so because of that, this is usually pathological. So even though this muscle um, has become thicker, it can cause heart problems because even though the muscle is thicker, it's not functional uh, the way that it should be. Uh, so we will learn more about this type of issue when we get to module three and we learn about heart failure. Okay, um, so some potential complications of hypertension. Um, so I said before, it's estimated that 50% of adults in the United States have hypertension, but it's largely probably underdiagnosed. Um, because of that, it's often called the silent killer because by itself, hypertension might not have any signs or symptoms at all. Um, so that's why it's considered silent because people might not know they have it. Um, this is one of the reasons it's really important to, you know, go and get your annual physical and get your blood pressure checked regularly because otherwise you might not know that you have hypertension and there are a lot of potential complications of hypertension. So once again, these complications are gonna be due to that increased um, shear stress on the arteries causing arterial damage, or it could be due to uh, increased strain on the heart. So things like atherosclerosis and arterial sclerosis due to increased um, arterial damage or endothelial damage of the cells lining the arteries. Um, that can lead to coronary artery disease, which is essentially arterial sclerosis of the coronary artery. Um, atrial fibrillation, which is the type of dysrhythmia, so an irregular heartbeat that affects the atrium. Uh, strokes, so um, either ischemic stroke that could be related to atherosclerosis um, or due to some sort of like embolism, once again, also related to atherosclerosis. Um, and then also aneurysms. So aneurysms are due to a weakening of the blood vessel. And if it becomes too weak, then you'll have kind of like a, a ballooning out of part of the blood vessel. And then if that ballooning out bursts, then that can cause um, an aneurysm, which essentially is like a, a bursting of the blood vessel. And then that can actually also cause a stroke. It causes a different type of stroke called a hemorrhagic stroke, which is like a brain bleed, a brain bleed. Guys, I gotta stop talking. And it's a good thing because we're done. Yay, that's the end of module two. We did it. What should you do to study? So many things. Um, what you should do first is go to the helpful links for pathology, for pathophysiology website, where I have all these helpful resources for you, such as a Quizlet set, which has all the wonderful vocab from this module. Um, and then the science and symptoms to practice, please, please, please. I highly recommend that you do the science and symptoms to practice at least three times every week because the science and symptoms is a big part of the midterm and it can get really complicated. So please make sure you are practicing that. Um, and then of course, there is a study guide posted in Canvas as part of module three. The study guide is actually pretty good. Um, so I don't, it's not a bad idea to get a head start on that because the midterm is gonna be here before we are. Okay, and with that, we did it. That was module two. I hope it was fun. It was fun for me and I will see you guys later.